There are growing calls for urgent intervention to address the escalating school violence in the country. Schools have now become a haven for shooting, stabbing and bullying incidents, leaving pupils and teachers alike fearing for their lives. Well, one education specialist, Tobo Katola, believes that these incidents are beginning to affect the performance of learners and indeed the teachers. Katola joins me in studio now for an explanation of what he has been researching. Mr. Katola, thank you very much for your time. You say there is an intricate relationship between the decline in academic performance and the escalating violence in schools. Explain that to us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Mr. Koli, in the studio. <coughs> and obviously, not in the good circumstances, you know. Sure. Uh, we could have been discussing other things which uh, bring a smile to our faces. But yeah, um, I was able to, to make a study and uh, just see the correlation between the schools that are uh, sort of victimized in terms of these shootings, violence, stabbings, like you say, and also just the pass rate over the years, the decline in the pass rate over the years. And, you know, I think over and above, you know, this is really a mental health crisis that I really think, um, you know, because, you know, these students are really bothered. They have a lot weighing in their shoulders, not to justify um, for them, but, you know, these are things that we can really have a conversation around, um, you know, just the burden that the students are having. Um, and also just the correlation between their performance and, you know, these distractions that they're having. Yeah, make that correlation for <coughs> us. The violence that they are experiencing at schools and, indeed, the academic performance, what we see, yeah. uh, the results of the I NBA. think just to just think of it in layman's terms, you know, imagine you're in a school and, you know, the school next door has a shooting and your friend has been killed or one of the students has been uh, shot or one of or the <coughs> one of the uh, stories I've been following uh, the UJ shootings and the East Rand shootings. Imagine you're a, you're a teacher at that school. You know, would you teach to the optimal level as a student? Would you concentrate to the optimal level? Um, so that is just the common sense behind it. But you know, once um, we start looking at the, at the academics in those areas in those locations, we see that the pass rate generally has went up, um, but it's very subjective. It's, it's really students which are in areas that you wouldn't even get into the school with a weapon. You wouldn't even get into school with a metal knife, uh, um, uh, just, just to say the least. So that is the correlation that I've really been seeing um, over the years. Even looking 10 years back, you know, looking at these past rates 10 years back, five years back, post-COVID, you know, it's, the, 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 it's, it's really shocking. It's really disheartening. You then talk about actionable measures that have got to be taken in order to curb this and so let's start with what you are proposing and that is community engagement programs yeah. these are i would want to think initiatives that are mm. going to foster a conversation and perhaps a sense of collective responsibility mm. among parents teachers yeah and indeed the, the community at large. Explain that a little yeah, bit. The reason why also I bring that is when, once we're looking at the last story of the principal that got shot, apparently there were bullets um, that entered the school first, you know, following your stories this side. The bullets entered the school first and then later on. So I'm sure there have been some students who knew what would have taken place mm -hmm. and it could have been prevented. Had there been an open dialogue, um, within the ecosystem of the school itself, parents, teachers, head of departments, prefects, and then in the wider community, you know, what is it that we are tolerating? Yeah. Are we tolerating weapons in our communities? Uh, and most of the time, uh, I'm not saying all of the time, most of the time we do know whose gun, who has the gun, who has the, the weapons uh, within our communities. So these are things that having an open dialogue sitting down with our students, sitting down, having the students also being comfortable with reporting anonymously mm. to their teachers. Mm. I believe um, some of these incidents could be, could be uh, prevented. Let me focus the attention a little bit on this element of the collaboration between the community, the school, uh, and indeed the, the parents. Parental responsibility. Mm. I'd like to focus the attention there because mm. if a child is going to bring a gun to school, mm. that gun, in all probability,
belongs to the family, yeah. Yeah. why would a parent have been so careless to allow for his or her gun mm. to be taken by the child, presumably from a safe at home, mm. and taken to school? Yeah. What responsibility should that parent bear mm. for mm. negligence? Because that's yeah. what it is. It is. And these are minors. The kids are minors. Um, I read one of the stories also <clears throat> that the parent actually gave the gun to the student to defend themselves. <laughs> so, you know, some of these cases, um, they, they, are, they are very special and, you know, you tend to sit down, which is why I started the conversation by saying this is really a mental health uh, uh, crisis that in the long run, there should be measures of, you know, mental health uh, that we really put in place. But even in the short run, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Toli, if we can... Um, be searched for weapons when going to watch uh, uh, 90,000 uh, um, people watching a soccer game. Can't we do that for a school with less than 1,000 students? Uh, what are we really saying? Can we search people coming 90,000 within a fraction of the time um, that it takes that we could be searching these students as they get into the premises? So these are some of the things that we could also just implement yeah. uh, in the short run. Let's talk then about conflict resolution, because no. if a student, basically a child, mm. believes that the only way to resolve mm. a tiff between himself and a fellow student mm. is by engaging in violence, then there is something wrong with that child, mm. Mm. perhaps even from where he comes from, mm. Conflict resolution. Yeah. Can we talk about that? What can be done to teach children that there are other ways to solve quarrels? Yeah, we need, we need to, and we really advocate for having uh, school psychologists, you know, people in the school that children are able to vent out. Boys and girls, you know, I think um, <clears throat> not to, to discount the situation, um, but, you know, even boys, I feel boys are being neglected um, um, really because, you know, we, spend to, we, we tend to spend a lot of time uh, empowering the, the young ladies. And in terms of de-escalating situations, um, I, think, I think the ladies are, are actually better than us, um, you know. So I think we, we really advocate for that, having uh, psychologists in schools, having even the teachers themselves be able to de-escalate uh, situations. When did we get to a point where I was telling one of my mates that, you know, back in our days, if um, you had a, a squabble with a teacher, we used to swear at the teachers, <laughs> you know. So when did we get from swearing at a teacher to shooting, to bringing a weapon, and even for teachers to also be afraid for their lives, because they are. And that is what one of the, uh, one of the variables I was observing, that even, even teachers are, are scared for their lives. They are not able to teach to the optimal level that they could. They are not able to discipline uh, Mr. Toli. Because you don't know that you discipline a child mm. and you don't know how high will their anger levels be for them to bring a gun to school, for them to stab you, you know. No, so those seen. are some of the variables that um, we've, been, we've been studying. And indeed, many of these incidents make it to social media and you see those video clips yeah. trending for days. And yeah. that then perhaps brings us to our last point, increased security measures at schools because... I suppose this is the solution, yeah. at least for the time being, whilst mm. we inculcate this culture of mm. trying to resolve quarrels, not through fights, mm. but by merely engaging yeah. one another. Increased, uh, increased security, is that the solution right now? That is the short term, but I have a long term solution also. Mm. We need to look at the behavior of students. We need behavioral psychologists. Uh, to be there in our schools. We need <coughs> people like ourselves who are big brothers and big sisters uh, of schools. We've been deployed to a number of schools as, as tutors, uh, come from a company called Lion Tutoring, would be deployed to a school. We know the students that are not behaving uh, well. We know the students where the behavior is even almost borderline uh, psychology uh, problems, that uh, it's not normal. We can't have a normal classroom setup with those uh, students, you know, they need 
another intervention, not to stigmatize them, but to help them better. So yeah. um, deploying people like ourselves, even sometimes we are deployed to students' homes as tutors. Um, we know the students that have behavioral problems. We know the students who have been traumatized uh, by obviously past incidences uh, that have happened in their lives. And we are not the experts in that because we are educators, but we can always work with experts to say, you know, this is something that we can start working with at a home level, yeah. and then it becomes a societal level. Tobo Khatola, let me thank you very much for your time.